You are listening to 95.7 FM WELT, Fort Wayne, Radioactive. The opinions and views expressed in the show are those of the hosts and guests only. They do not represent those of Free Thought Fort Wayne, WELT, or any other organization. Welcome to the Hoosier Humanist Hour, where we explore science, religion, culture, ethics, and community from the humanist perspective. Join us as we discuss those topics and more, free from the ideologies of religion and superstition. Hello and welcome to another fine hour of the Hoosier Humanist Hour. Uh, this show, as usual, is put together by members of Free Thought Fort Wayne, chapter of the American Humanist Association. Our email address is fortwayneaha at gmail.com. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash freethoughtfw. And our phone number is 260-376-2268. Uh, I think we have an interesting topic for everyone today. Um, we're going to be talking about fake or pseudoscience. Uh, last time we had a science topic. We talked about science deniers. Um, today is a little bit of a different take on, uh, uh, you know, those kind of anti-science uh, mindsets out there. Uh, we have uh, myself, V, today. Uh, we have D. We have Chris, Caleb, and our sound engineer, Andrew. Um, Hello. How are you guys doing? Great. Yeah. Good, good, good. Well, um, let's just dive right into this thing. I don't think I have any announcements. Oh, let me just uh, mention um, our free thought group has regular weekly meetings. Uh, we have a Sunday meeting from 11 to 1 at Old Crown, and we have a Wednesday evening meeting from 6 to 8 at uh, Matt Anthony's. So meetings are open to whoever wants to show up. Um, I think that's all I have. So let's jump right into it. So what is uh, what is fake science? Um, you know, one quick, uh, you know, summary that I have is science sounding claims, articles, or books, they're not true. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be with some kind of bad intent behind it. Uh, it just has to be false. You know, sometimes people are just wrong. Um, but oftentimes, you know, they're, they're actually trying to sell you something. Um, and, you know, as I said, it comes in many forms. Uh, you'll see it on the web. You'll see it in the bookstore. Um, you'll see it everywhere. Uh, even famous people, um, you know, suggest all kinds of fake or pseudosciences out there uh, some of the famous ones uh, you know even dr oz has pushed some uh, fake cures on his show uh, there's a guy named deepak chopra he likes all these spiritual things that are all completely fake uh, you know um i got a question about dr oz yeah. right off the top go did ahead he did he just like take a downhill turn over the last like 10, 15 years, or have I just gotten smarter? I don't, I can't tell because he's, he is, he's marketing a lot of stuff. That's like obviously fake. Like there's no, just all kinds of like weight loss pills. And he just seems kind of quacky to me now. Has anybody else noticed a change in him and the way he markets himself? I can't, uh, I can't speak too much to a change cause I haven't really uh, paid attention to him for a long time, but, I think there's definitely a possibility. I think that the the financial um, reward there, there's yeah. a thing that is really built up around um, selling pseudoscience or fake science, and um, the the draw or the appeal of it to a lot of people uh, is that it's much less uh, surrounded by red tape. It's much less surround uh, surrounded by obstacles. Um, for example, there's no regulatory commissions, there's no peer review for it, there's no trials that need to be verified, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot less stages that need to go into marketing something uh, that falls under the category of fake science. So when you're uh, an ad, a, a person that is trying to build up a name or a brand for yourself, um, like Dr. Oz or anybody else in his position, um, I think that it could definitely be extremely enticing to see that kind of uh, money 
available and that kind of sponsorship available for your brand name. Um, so I don't know that that just comes to me right off the bat is it may not have been a change per se, but the, there are also very much might be this temptation to say, well, if the product is there and I'm being endorsed for it, or they're asking for my endorsement in, in return for monetary compensation, then you know maybe it's not so bad. Yeah, definitely. The last time that I uh, watched one of his shows, uh, you know, he definitely was pushing a lot of these, you know, weight loss pills and uh, the, uh, all, all all kinds of weird herbs and and who knows what. They have zero uh, backing, you know, in in real science. Um, you know, one of the other examples that that I had given, uh, um, you know, in my in my notes that I sent to everyone was. Uh, you know, Deepak Chopra, and he's got this uh, book that came out years and years ago called The Ageless Body. And you can see him on the picture, you know, looks like a nice young guy, you know, smooth skin and all that. And you see Deepak Chopra today, and, you know, he's he's old, wrinkly and all that. And it's like, <laughs> okay, so your, your ageless body doesn't really work that well. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it pulled in a few tens of millions of dollars before. Huh? <laughs> Might very well have. Yeah, there are a lot of people follow the guy. A lot of people yeah. believe what he's saying. He's very convincing. You know, I've heard him in, uh, you know, debates with uh, some really famous people. And and boy, he he's good at arguing his point. You know, he's got he knows how to say things. And uh, it, it just takes a little bit of digging to find out that he's all completely wrong on all of it. But in that moment. You may actually believe him and, you know, you may actually buy his book, even if it is just to see what it's all about. You know, he makes his money. He's happy about it. Moves on. <laughs> so the, que the question for me is, is like Deepak Chopra really, he seems to come off as somebody who really believes what he's selling. Um, just in general, like his philosophy in life, he seems to be a genuine, true believer of it. But Dr. Oz, I don't get the impression he's a true believer of what he's selling. So... I guess, you know, trying to attribute any kind of moral qualities to, <laughs> yeah. to these people is difficult, but they, they have the term doctor in front of their name, their last name. Right, so right. all of a sudden they have, uh, you know, this authority bias more or less working in their head and they just believe everything that comes out of his mouth. Right. Yeah. That and that's one thing about science is that, you know, just because somebody is, you know, uh, a quote unquote authority figure. You shouldn't really trust everything they say. You know, there is something to be said about, you know, only believing science that has gone through the normal science process. You know, you didn't have to short circuit the entire scientific process to publish your book or whatever. And, you know, fake science has real consequences for people. Um, you know, yes. it's it's bad medical advice. Uh it, it can get you sicker, it can kill you, it can delay treatment that you need, it can cause more suffering than, um, than you need to have. You know, if it's more of an environmental type thing, you know, it can result with a, a damaged environment. There's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of consequences to these, uh, you know, fake sciences. Uh, it's not just the fact that somebody is going to make money, although that's, uh, you know, it's a bad thing when it's, uh, when it's a fake product, you know, we don't like to buy knockoffs of, of different things. You know, we like to buy the, the actual real thing. Um, but I know uh, a few years ago, probably been about 10 years ago by now, um, I used to know this guy that had cancer. And, I mean, that guy was a bear of a guy. You know, he would grab your hand to shake and he will crush your hand. That, that was his regular handshake. A uh, real nice guy. And... You know, somebody had told him that goat milk, you know, was going to help him uh, with his cancer. And, you know, he was looking around to see where he could buy fresh goat milk that wasn't uh, pasteurized. He wanted unpasteurized goat milk. For some reason, when you pasteurize it, that effect, you know, was going away. So so he was he was looking for that. I don't think he delayed any of his other treatment or disregarded his other treatment for that. So in that case, it wasn't that bad. But... You know, there's people to do, you know, there's people that wouldn't go do their chemo or, or whatever the doctor recommended and they'll go, they'll go looking for goat milk. <laughs> well, and I think, 
uh, you touched on a really important part about what is what are some of the hidden dangers behind uh, fake science or pseudoscience because um, I've I've had a few experiences here even recently uh, where and I've kind of coined the term institutionalized pseudoscience where we start yeah. to see this thing this kind of stuff happening uh, and it's it's very accepted and that makes it more dangerous for a couple of different reasons. Um, for example, I was looking through my, uh, I have a, you know, I have a flex spending account, like a lot of people do or a health savings account, like a lot of people do. And I was just kind of, I'm new to the idea. I just got it. And I've never really had one before. And I was just kind of looking through what I can and can't purchase, uh, using this, this account, and finding out, okay, what are some of the stipulations? You know, because they have rules. They say, okay, well, you need a prescription for this, or you need a letter from a doctor for this. Um, and as I was going through it, I was kind of a little flabbergasted. I ended up calling calling my insurance company and saying, "What's what is all this?" Because I needed a ban or a, a, a prescription. I needed a doctor's prescription to be reimbursed for buying over the counter. Um, diarrhea pills wow <laughs> medication um or even uh other things uh um uh allergy medicine over-the-counter allergy medicine i needed a prescription for painkillers ibuprofen i needed a prescription for but there was other categories listed like uh, and a lot of people uh, I, I say this cautiously because a lot of people kind of go what but um chiropractics which a lot of people think is a medical area, which actually does not have a whole lot of verified peer review behind it. Um, yeah, real quick, if I can interrupt for just a sec. Sure, sure. I have a very close friend. Well, actually, let me take that back. Used to have a very close friend. Uh, <laughs> he swore up and down that her going to the chiropractor, her chiropractor cured her of her lactose intolerance. <laughs> She swears that up and down. Wow. And she proves this by eating dairy product constantly. And she's perfectly fine. And she says that it's every, you know, she, she, she gives all the credit to her chiropractor. She said she used to be uh, lactose intolerant. Someone told her to go to a chiropractor. Lo and behold, she's no longer lactose intolerant. Hasn't been since she was like 13 years old or something. And it could possibly be that she was never actually lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> No, no way. It couldn't no, possibly. no. Come on. <laughs> it's that pinched nerve in the fifth lumbar, man. That's right. The lactose intolerant nerve. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, and I, I laugh, I laugh, but, you know, that is, it's a reality. That is something that a lot of people still very much um, buy into, or they, they have a lot of anecdotal evidence that they try to bring to support that, but the reality of it is, is, you know, when we when we look at the real peer review and the the actual um, empirical evidence uh, in the medical field, there's not a lot, if any, uh, that really stands up to scrutiny to support that. So chiropractics, in my in my mind, definitely fits the the field of pseudoscience. But when I was looking at my FSA. Um, I did not need a prescription for chiropractics at all. Oh, wow. That's interesting. At all. Um, Christian science practitioners did not need a prescription at all, which hmm. I was just kind of like, you know, that's fine. But um, you can't get ibuprofen. <laughs> but I can't get ibuprofen. I, you know, I was like, really? I can't go out and get, I can't even remember. There was something else just ridiculous. It was something that I couldn't get for my own family without a doctor's prescription. But yet, uh, I could go and spend twelve thousand dollars on therapy that has no evidence to really support it whatsoever, and my FSA would pay for it right out of pocket. That was so that kind of was confusing. And then right on top of that, um, uh, somebody very close to me, a, a very close family member, has recently been struggling, like you said, with with cancer, and it's stage four cancer. It's very serious. And as I was going through some of the information, you know, we know that there's there's not a lot of time left and that there's not a lot of treatment options left. We've tried a lot of things. Um, one of the things that was in his medical file that was given to us as information that is a possibility, and I respect his doctors 100%. They are fantastic doctors. Um, 
But in his recommendations, they, they said, you know, well, you might want to try. It's a possibility. Some people have had varying uh, success with acupressure for treating wow. pain. And again, acupressure is something that's very prevalent in our society. A lot of people uh, have had experiences with this and uh, will attribute varied success to it. But when we look at the evidence, there's just not uh, empirical peer-reviewed scientific evidence to, to really support the efficacy, the effect of this working. But here we are um, giving, having this given in all seriousness. And I, it, made me, it gave me a little bit of pause. I wasn't angry. Uh, I was just like, you know, how many people have tried to do this when there are other treatment options that may be more effective? Uh, that are evidence-based, that are empirically supported and peer-reviewed, um, and how much further could we have gotten had we been putting the money that goes into these other pseudoscientific uh, practices towards those things? Um, and it made me think. I, it kind of got me thinking about why why are these being considered viable options? And I kind of started thinking about the cost. Because one of the medications that we had available to us was ten thousand dollars a month. Wow. Now, yeah. Now that's a lot. That's just for one pill. Um, because of the the staggering cost of that, you know, luckily we we didn't have to worry about it. We had enough options, financial options that were able to cover that. But for a lot of people, that's a very personal area of finances, being able to support or afford the kind of care that they need. And I think that um, pseudoscience kind of preys upon that because they can set the price because they're not really providing anything. They're providing um, a belief in something. So they can set the cost low enough to target people, to get them to pay for it, um, but still reap a profit from it. And I feel like when that's uh, ingrained in our society, we're really seeing a large drain on finances, not just for the people that have a hard time affording what they really, really do need, but also um, institutionally. Yeah, let me let me throw in something uh, something there in terms of that whole institutionalization of of this uh, of this nonsense. Um, there are actually universities out there that have entire degrees in this complementary medicine. They call it. Uh, you know, I was actually just, uh, it took me two seconds to Google it and find out Rutgers. I mean, of all the universities out there, Rutgers School of Health Professions has a department. Uh, of, in the Department of Primary Care, they have the Institute for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. I mean, that's your chiropractors, that's your acupuncturists, that's that's all that other stuff that's, you know, that's your uh, herbalists and, and, and homeopaths. And, you know, those are, uh, you know, it, and, and that's a reputable school. I mean, Rutgers is not a small school. Right. Uh, you know, it's a famous school. People, people will try it. You know, at the bottom of the page, it says the State University of New Jersey, you know. So, so it's a state school. And they have complementary and alternative medicine. And um, you know, one thing I like, uh, a, a podcast I really like to listen to is something called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Dr. Stephen Novella does uh, part of that. And one day he had a, I was listening to a, a speech that he was giving. And in part of it, he said, uh, you know, do you know what's uh, alternative medicine that works? Uh, wh what's that called? Medicine. medicine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it's, you don't need to call it alternative medicine if it works, because if it works, it's just medicine. Right. You know, uh, there's nothing alternative to it once it's proven, once you see the results. Uh, you know, there's no need to call it alternative anymore, you know. But well, you need to go through the standards. Consistently reproduced is also, you know, that's important. And I think that's where a lot of we can we kind of see some evidence for um, for catching pseudoscience when, you know, because people say, well, if it's fake science, how do I tell? 
And that's the hard right. part. How do I tell? Not everybody has the ability or the time to sift through reams of, mm. of empirical studies. Um, I have a ball. I, I was, uh, I'm glad that you asked that because I actually learned a, recently, actually, a, a pretty good um, mental shortcut to help people kind of figure this out. Um, generally speaking, uh, if it's real science, it's going to try to disprove itself. Uh, all the research done into it is going to try and disprove whatever it is that it's trying to put forward. And it's going to make a prediction. Whereas the vast majority of all pseudosciences are trying to use collected data to uh, explain an event that's happening in the present or in the past. So, uh, uh, for example, um, Einstein, when he was making a prediction um, for relativity, he said, well, let's look at this eclipse, and if we see what I predict we'll see, then chances are my theory is correct. If we don't see it, my theory is completely wrong, and we need to start over. Whereas um, something like... Um, Ghosts, for example, people who go hunting for ghosts, I touched on this last week, um, they use quote-unquote scientific equipment, scientific sounding words, um, a lot of fancy um, abstruse theories and hypotheses to try and explain. So they'll go around and they'll catch uh, a high um, e-reader meeting, uh, reading rather, and they'll sit in that spot, they'll try to do an EVP session, try to catch something on camera. But the point is, is they're, they're looking for things to confirm their theory in the present. And they're going to find it because they're looking for it, uh, essentially. Or they're they not... won't, but if they don't, then they will continue looking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a great point. And even if they don't find anything, um, they'll still believe in whatever it is that they're looking for. Um, yeah, they're leading the evidence. That's called leading the evidence. Yeah, exactly. Instead of um, following the evidence, you're leading the evidence. And that's, that's not really, science. Exactly. That's a really interesting distinction, Caleb. Yes. I, I'd like that. Yeah. Well, so then, so are you uh, – I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm understanding. So when we're looking at fake science and pseudoscience, um, so what you're saying is we really ought to look for uh, – evidence that the people doing the research have been open to it being discredited yeah absolutely so because for example like i had mentioned if einstein's prediction i want to emphasize that word again had been wrong he would have had to rewrite his uh, hypothesis or probably even throw it away altogether and as a scientist if that had been the case if he would have had to throw it away like yesterday's newspaper he would have done that whereas if you're going out ghost hunting and you get inconclusive results, you'll just think, oh, I had a bad night, move on to the next case. Uh, you can't make predictions. You can't say, okay, well, this person died in this room at this time. There's a lot of people that say they hear or see things in this room at this particular time. So let's go to that room and see if we find anything. And if you don't find anything in that room at that time with all this prior quote-unquote evidence uh, saying that there should be something happening there, regardless of what you find, whether you think you have found something or not, chances are you're going to walk away still thinking that something was probably there, you just didn't happen to catch it. Right. Okay. Yeah, with these when nebulous it, claims, with these hidden things, things you can't see, things you don't know how they work, and, you know, there's there's excuses uh, that, that can be made very easily um, to, you know, dismiss your null result, you know, because that's a lot of what happens in science, you know, is you conduct an experiment and you get a, a null result, you know, your result is inconclusive, you know, it doesn't confirm or it doesn't disprove your theory. Well, you know, that happens. You have to accept it. But, you know, a lot of those people, they just, uh, they just move on, you know, and then look for the, look for the next thing. Uh, you know, they go into the next house and look for the next ghost. Uh, but I have a list actually over here, guys, of uh, how to spot fake sciences. And it's, and it's written, and I, I came up with the list, you know, I haven't, uh, looked for that list anywhere else. Uh, and, I, and I was trying to think of ways that people that don't have science degrees can distinguish fake from real science. And, and it's, it's, it's quite a long list. I mean, I have probably a good uh, dozen claims in there, but they're very easy to evaluate. And, um, you know, they won't always lead you to the fake science, but they'll help you get there. They'll help you at least 
get your spidey senses tingling, you know, so to say. Um, and you know, here's so let's start with my with my top claim here. You know, how to spot fake science? Are you know, let's say somebody makes a claim, and um, you know, you may believe it, you may not believe it. Well, if the person that makes that claim is trying to sell you something, if you believe them, that should get your spidey senses tingling. You know, uh, when somebody like Lawrence Krauss uh, gets on stage and start talking about quantum mechanics or cosmology or anything like that, he's not selling you anything. You know, his salary from the university gets paid just the same. You know, he doesn't have to go and make these public uh, statements. He could just keep collecting his salary and it's all good. Make his uh, you know little experiments and stuff like that. Um, so, so that's one way. Um, what do you guys think of that? Like, do you think the, the, the money motive, like how important do you guys think the money motive behind fake science is? I think it's huge. I, I do. I think it's interesting what you brought up with Lawrence Krauss, because I would say that he is trying to sell you something. So, <laughs> um, but I think when it comes to money as being the thing that is motivating the selling, then yeah, I think that is a pretty good distinction. Well, and I, I like uh, how you, how you kind of put, put the play on words to sell. Um, because I think that that's something that, that pseudoscience peddlers often are very, very adept at doing. They're adept at using wordplay and spin to kind of change the the argument a little bit uh, when they're trying to push something. So when you say that, that Lawrence Krauss, and I don't know, I, I'm not an expert, but when you, when you say Lawrence Krauss is trying to quote unquote sell you something, I don't really know if that's what we're trying to say. I think really he's an advocate for something, but he's not actually physically trying yeah. to get you pay for anything maybe a maybe another way to think about it is do people want you to believe or like do they want you to believe what they're what they're telling you well, like if something true. something's just a fact you know well you can believe it or not but that's the truth right. unless there's some sort of personal you know relationship with the person or some other circumstance and that's true i think um and i think that people who have kind of like i said been peddling pseudoscience for a long time um, I think it's been around for a long time. I mean, we we know about snake oil sale, salespeople. We know about people who used to travel, uh, you know, d decades ago, used to travel all of the United States selling any gadget that they could find just because they could sell it in a town. So they would have their wagons. I mean, uh, I think the Music Man is a really good example. Uh, if you if you like uh, musicals of, you know, he was a peddler that would go around and sell you anything. He would sell you a tonic that maybe would make you miraculously not cough and also be able to play the harmonica. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they'll spin it however they need to in order to get you to believe in it and or give them money for it. Well, do so you, that's really I'm sorry. I no, go ahead. You. Do you think that they really believe it? I think, I mean, yeah, for instance, no, I, I don't want to generalize because I think there are people who truly believe in it um the example comes to mind of essential oils um essential oils we have to ask ourselves why are they essential and if they're essential why doesn't my body produce them <laughs> <laughs> that, no, yes. but, but i i know i have friends of mine and i and I, I i like to stress that i do have friends that are still very good friends of mine and i care for them very deeply um to, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair, I don't know anything about these essential oil things. If they're essential, why don't we have them? But vitamin C is essential, but we don't right. have to produce that either. Uh, okay, no, Zin, see, that's a good point. I don't that's know a really good point. It's, sorry, it's a kind of a cheap... But, know, <laughs> okay, and that's a fair point. Um, but, you know, so I like I said, it, that is a cheap shot at it, but sure. But so I have friends who do uh, probably very, very deeply believe in the efficacy of that. Um, but 
when we look at the empirical evidence of it, or if we actually test it, we can't consistently produce the same results and control for variables. Um, so it makes me go, well, there's there may be more uh, placebo effect in that than anything else. And um, so I think I don't want to generalize and say that they all believe truly in it or that they all don't believe in it. I think that there's a wide variance there. Some people may actually believe it and they may actually believe it with a good intent. Um, and yet there are other people out there who, for whatever reason, have less moral scruples and uh, may have just decided that they're going to make their lot in life selling it that way. Yeah. So you know, relativism <laughs> makes a lot of things possible. Quick question. <laughs> so if you brought up the circumstances where um, the doctor basically said, here's what we think you should do, but also maybe you should try acupuncture more or less. Right. right. And you're making the claim. I'm gathering that acupuncture is a pseudo science, right? I don't know anything about it. Um, but does, does that take away from what the doctor said? The other option, <laughs> like how can you tell the difference between the two? If you have somebody making a claim, like, Right. You you're talking about these tests and such. Are you actually looking at this data yourself? Um, in some instances, I mean, I think that in order to be an informed person, I, I feel a responsibility to at least attempt to sure. try to become informed. But you know, like you said, you, I or like I said earlier, you can't constantly be. Nobody has time to constantly be researching every PubMed out there and be up to date on that. So. You do have to kind of establish a, uh, a kind of a, uh, I think we talked a, little, a few a few weeks ago about heuristics. You have to kind of establish some, yeah. some baseline critical thinking that, like v, uh, v said, um, that kind of get your spidey senses tingling. Um, so, for example, when the doctor says, oh, well, I'm, I'm recommending that we try this particular pharmaceutical treatment and it has a standard rate of success of this and it's going to interact with this kind of medication you're already on and we've seen that it has a possibility for this side effect but it only happens in this percentage of people that to me doesn't set off any bells sure that says yeah okay, so there's been some research here you but know, with acupuncture. Because, well, you could also try acupuncture. Some people have had very effects <laughs> of it, and sure. it can't hurt. <laughs> that makes me go. Argh. Sure. Yeah. So, so let's continue down my list because I yeah, think you know some of the questions. Some of the questions that that uh, you guys brought up already are actually right on my list. So, one thing okay. about acupuncture, you know, you, you'll you'll hear those guys talk about the various energies in your body and how they get stimulated by the acupuncture and all that. I mean, that's a red flag right there. Um, you know, find me a, a normal doctor or somebody that talks about all these weird energies that are flowing through your body. I mean, is it, is it electromagnetic energy? Is it like, what kind of energy is it? You know, is it some kind of weird, you oh, know, really? heat? Um, the you know, it, I mean, there's yeah, only so many kinds of Exactly. There's only so many kinds of energies. Yeah, you know when I was when I was growing up, I mean, well into my teens, I believed in these uh, energies that we used to have. You know, I I would look into things like uh, you know those uh, uh, those Asian folk, uh, usually monks, who who t for, you know claim to be able to harness their chi to do miraculous things. Um, I've even seen back in the day uh, somebody who allegedly was able to light a newspaper on fire with his chi plus you know i was a huge fan of you know like dragon ball z for example and i thought you know if i could do that that would be amazing i'd love to shoot fireballs out of my hands and you know so there was this <laughs> who wouldn't aspect well, I started of martial arts. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be great I, really, I, I was like hey look if somebody knows how to do this teach me <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> i'm still waiting by the way sorry uh, we totally I, sidetracked your no, so no, no. I mean, this, this is this is totally relevant. This is totally relevant. Um, no, I, I interrupted Caleb. He was right in the middle of making a point, and I totally <laughs> screwed him over. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's fine. Uh, no, essentially, all I'm getting at, uh, well, not all, but 
another thing that I was kind of getting to was, you know, there's also, the, you know, this this fantasy aspect of it, you know, that, that I found appealing. I don't know if that applies across the board. I can't speak for everybody. But, you know, I found the idea in and of itself appealing. And like I said, there were certain um, empirical points. I'll, I'll call them. I don't want to call them evidence. Um, like, for example, all of that, especially in the 90s where, for example, these uh, spontaneous human combustion things um, were in this big fad, at least for me. Um, I, I'd seen them all the time. These people who allegedly spontaneously burst into flames. And, you know, I thought that that might have been, quote, unquote, these energy fields. And they had all these amazing um, hypotheses as to how this might be the case and yada, yada, yada. Sorry, that's... I wish I had a better point to make there, guys. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's good. Because, uh, I mean, here's what's next on my list here is, um, you know, rather than all these weird energies and stuff, um, and it, it kind of goes hand in hand is, do they invoke quantum mechanics? <laughs> you know, if they involve, if, if they talk about quantum mechanics and, and they're not a physicist, they're probably wrong. And, you know, Deepak Chopra is is the perfect guy about that, because he keeps talking about, uh, you know, supposedly uh, in quantum mechanics, there's something called entanglement, and you can separate particles if they're entangled at a great distance, and if you do something to one, something happens to the other, and, you know, he takes that and just stretches it out to where everything in the universe is connected to everything, and anything you do to something has effect on everything else, and you can, just by thinking about it, improve your body. It's it's just pure nonsense, you know. Yeah, but, it's all. It does, but, but it feeds on the sorry, but it it feeds on that whole idea of a of a snowball fallacy that you know I think we've talked about before, or if we haven't, maybe we should. But that snowball fallacy of oh, if I start a snowball at the top of a mountain, uh, surely it's going to become this avalanche by the time it gets to the bottom. When maybe the reality of it is it might stop six inches away and just be a very tiny snowman. Um, yeah, you know, they often, I think you're right. Uh, when we're looking at fake science or pseudoscience, um, it will feed on people's hopes and kind of feed on their lack of understanding of, of how a certain thing works. And so it will feed them with these dreams of, of course it can have that effect. It can have these yeah. masterful effects, these huge effects, and they'll make it sound very scientific so that if we go, oh, yeah, that sounds like common sense. Sounds sensical. Yeah, when and it's very simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, this luxury of having the statistics of science behind us is only what? It can't be what more than at least to the degree we have it now, what, 50, 60 years old? I mean, yeah, it's a it's a new thing for humankind to be able to like judge information with this kind of critical thinking. So, I mean, it's going to take a while for it to permeate through the culture. I'd like to think that we'll get better at it with time. Or yeah, permeate I mean, through the humanity. people that the people that were using the scientific method as it is today, you know, uh, more than a hundred years ago, were just single individuals. Right. Uh, you know, just people that were really ahead of their time. Uh, like Newton, like um, uh, Galileo, like uh, Copernicus, sure. and and even they only used it for a specific discipline that they were really involved into. You know, um, Newton wasn't using his scientific thinking in all aspects of his life. It was just focused on you know on gravity, on some mathematics, on this and that. Um, so, Yet yeah, he... it is very new. It is very new. Yet he was, uh, Newton himself was known for spending a great deal of time on pseudoscience, alchemy, exactly. and, and that exactly. sort of stuff. So even one of the smartest men who've ever lived, arguably, yeah. <laughs> still can be a victim of it. It's very exactly. difficult to get away from it. Yeah, well, I, and that's I, why these pointers that, that I have listed here are, you know, are, are so powerful. They're simple, they're easy to understand, and anybody can use them. And it should at least get you thinking. You know, but they they don't work across the board, though. No, no, but but they get you started, you sure. know. And then there's more to them. So what what I have next on the list there is, uh, does the language sound like your science teacher? Uh, you know, does mainstream mm -hmm. science agree? So 
uh, and pseudoscientists have, have started to, you know, sound like your science teacher more and more. But still, they, I, I think if you listen to an actual scientist or science teacher or, you know, and, and you, then you listen to a pseudoscience guy, like, you'll be able to tell the difference in language that they use. You know, and, and that's a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Um, before I touch on this, I just wanted to do a quick PSA. There's a documentary out there right now that's been out for quite a while. Um, some of you probably heard it. It's called What the Bleep Do We Know? Um, yeah, it's fun. That that documentary is horrible. If you have seen it, <laughs> just forget everything that you learned from that documentary. That documentary is <laughs> um, absurd. Uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics you're, you're going to find out there. They, they try to uh, essentially personify the universe. It's very solipsistic. They, they, they make this claim that as observers, as human uh, conscious observers, we have the capacity to essentially control reality somehow. That's their underlying claim there. Um, and it's completely false. And it's way too complicated to get into why that's not the case. Um, There's another. Lab. The secret, um, too. Reminds me of the secret. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, there's this huge misunderstanding of what quantum mechanics really is even trying to explain and how it works and what it is. Um, I don't fully understand it. Nobody does. But well, I, because that's of that, important. Because there's even scientists, quantum physicists, I've heard them say, uh, if you, you or anybody you know says they understand quantum physics, right. they don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's important because it's such a new field and there's so many variables. I was going to touch back on what V said, too. Uh, v said, you know, you, you have to listen to the language that these people are using. But I think it's also you have to think or hear and listen to the reasoning and the, the ways that they reason, because when you hear a, a real scientist talking very scientifically, you'll hear a lot of uh, non-absolutes. Yeah. You'll hear them talking in, in probabilities and saying, well, that, that's not very highly probable, or, well, that could be, but not very probable, or, oh, well, this is pretty probable. We feel that this is you know fairly significant. And I feel like a lot of other pseudoscience peddlers or people that talk about quantum mechanics like Deepak Chopra and things um, often try to make absolute claims about how it works or what it can affect with very little substantiation behind it. Yeah, isn't that really the crux of a lot of this stuff? These these claims, these absolute claims people make on on things just really throw people off. People want to think in black or black and white terms when really well, things are much more probabilistic. <laughs> that's yeah, a hard thing. things are very great. Hard. That's a that's a hard thing to for people to learn. Um, I don't, I don't know why, but it was a tough one for me to get over. I don't know if it was from my background or not, but understanding how probabilistic reality is or what we know is was a, a big leap for me. <laughs> There's an excellent resource on YouTube. Um, uh, it's called PBS Space Time. Oh, I um, love that too. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> highly, highly recommend that to any of our listeners and to uh, any of you guys as well. Um, it's an excellent introduction to all of this, really. They have things on quantum mechanics, on um, relativity, uh, all, uh, pretty much all sort on all scientific topics. But they really delve into it, and it's they're going to make it as easily understandable as it probably can be at the moment. I, I also recommend, obviously, looking into other sources as well. Don't just rely on the one, but. PBS space time as far as I can, as far, I'm sorry, as far as all of the different resources that I've come across, that's probably the most layman one I've been able to find, easily understandable, and they're very thorough. I, I highly recommend them. I concur. Yeah. So, so another thing on there that we kind of sort of touched upon a little bit is, uh, you know, are there claims too good to be true? Uh, you know, and... Are their claims backed by trustworthy institutions? You know, because that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, as actually we mentioned earlier, you know, we have this institutionalized pseudoscience. So maybe that that second one there, uh, you know, isn't that critical. But you know, claims that are too good to be true. Uh, you know, some of those 
uh, essential oils or some of those, you know, there's something called miracle mineral solutions. Um, you know, they're supposed to cure everything, you know, from asthma to cancer, from the common cold to, uh, you know, disease that will kill you. Um, and, you know, that, that should be a red flag. You know, as we were mentioning earlier, you know, scientists quantify uh, their expectations. You know, they, they'll tell you, okay, well, we expect that, uh, you know, 70% of the people with this disease will get better if you take this pill. Or, you know, if you take quantum mechanics, scientists will tell you, okay, well, if we perform this experiment, you know, our results should be this plus minus 5%. You know, so so there's a lot of, uh, you know, a ways that that the, the results are constrained and their claims are constrained, and they only apply in certain ways in certain cases. And you know, pseudoscientists too often um, just make claims that are too good to be true. And as we all know, you know, if, some, if something's too good to be true, it probably isn't. And that's that's a very simple way also to to look at it and, and know that okay there's something going on there yeah if i honestly my general rule of thumb is if the word miracle is in the title or the commercial i tend to ignore it yes Quite. yes it's, you should clue is in the title avoid commercials <laughs> <laughs> yeah if, if you if your product relies on miracles well <laughs> you know what if the miracle doesn't work for me Probably not as effective as you claim it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there, is, is there a brand name Miracle out there yet? Yeah, because somebody needs to start this Miracle Everything. Yeah. We could do that. Miracle Miracles. Well, I don't <laughs> miracle, know if the, if, the, if the Miracle Mineral Solutions are a brand or not. I'm not sure. They might be a brand name too, other than just what they're called. Oh, if they're not, somebody should snap that up right away. <laughs> that is the perfect yeah, name maybe. for any product. But we've we've seen that in history too. Tonic water, you know. I mean, there's. I love to see the old advertisements for for just regular tonic water. And that that would, stuff turn those people blue. It did all kinds of stuff. I mean, well, that was colloid silver. Oh, uh, that. But yeah. you know, that's another another form of pseudoscience. Everybody, you know, and and now you kind of like. I think my grandmother. I love her to death, but my grandmother tried to tell me that uh, her dentist told her that the reason that uh, she had MS. He tried to tell her, my dentist, or his, her dentist no, tried no. to tell her, somebody tried to tell her she it had, was, was it Amish faith oh sorry, an Amish faith healer tried to tell her she had MS. And her dentist said that it was because of her silver fillings. No, the Amish faith healer. No, the Amish faith healer. Sorry, my wife's yeah. correcting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's interesting. Tell wow. her that it was because of her silver fillings. So she went to her dentist to get the silver fillings out. They didn't have colloid silver in her fillings because wow. that's illegal so but she believed it and the poor poor woman spent money on it um wow. and then you know magically her ms is cured well how many people died or were <laughs> harmed by bleeding for centuries right? well and that brings to another one that i don't even think we've talked touched on yet but um the the vaccine refusals yeah. oh yeah a large purport, or largely because of a lot of pseudoscience that has been brought into uh, a very public um, area, and it causes a lot of damage. Epidemic outbreaks. Um, we saw measles come back. We saw what else was it? Smallpox, I think. Um, I can't remember. Somebody refresh my memory, but um, yeah, was, uh, no, not smallpox. Really no, it wouldn't be smallpox. No, smallpox, smallpox is. <laughs> Chicken pox, maybe, or something, but not smallpox. I can't my head, but I remember yeah, yeah. it was something that had been eradicated. It was yeah. gone. Measles or mumps or something. Yeah. Um, and to see that happen, to see that come back, something that had been completely ah, vaccinated against, it had been completely gone. Uh, and to see that come back simply because people stopped using science because of contraindicative pseudoscience um, demonstrates the persuasive power of pseudoscience that we really have to learn to be weary of. 
Yeah, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, anti-vaxxers and colloidal silver or whatever it's called. Um, I am on Facebook. Um, I'm a member of this group that has infiltrated various anti-vaxxer groups. And they take screenshots of their of their discussions and post them on their in their group. And I've seen it on multiple occasions, people, uh, you know, suggesting to other people, you know, giving medical advice to other people uh, about using colloidal silver to cure various disease. I mean, it's so it, it's. Uh. I'd actually kind of like at this point to to touch on the, the moral dimension a little bit, because it is. The, the way that I see it, there's some uh, ethical negligence that's uh, occurring um, from multiple people here. So, for example, somebody in, out of the goodness of their own heart really trying to do a good thing. They have good intent telling somebody with cancer who's, who stays stage three, for example, that they just found this exotic cure. Uh, they can find it in Mexico and that, that there's allegedly these amazing results, right? Well, that person that they told is going to spend hopefully spend several hours of their life looking into this. Um, now, that in and of itself is, in my opinion, um, morally appalling. These people have a very limited time left to enjoy life, um, chances are, and you making them waste valuable time um, is, in my opinion, just, I don't want to say abhorrent anymore, but it's... <laughs> I really don't, because like I said, it's it, they, they have good intentions, but the, the results are the antithesis of that. Uh, so, there, so there's that factor. And then if they, assuming that they look into this and think to themselves, oh, may, maybe we actually do have something here, then they're going to spend even more time and money at this point to get this medicine. And they're going to waste their time. And they might even stop using their appropriate medication because they think that this medication is going to do better. For example, a lot of people stop using chemo to try alternative medicines because everyone hates chemo. Uh, that's, that's no secret. So a lot of people will, want, will desperately want to try something else. And when you give them these suggestions, not only are you wasting their time, chances are, and their money, but you're also going to give them some false hope. And that, to me, is um, also... Um, one of the worst aspects of this whole dilemma, uh, you're, you're telling these people um, that you have probably found this, this awesome miracle cure, and all they need to do is, is, is spend the time and the money and invest in it, and hopefully they'll get better. Um, now, obviously, they're not going to tell them that they will get better. I would hope not. But even still, like I said, there's just this, this moral dimension that's being completely ignored here. Um, and people need to stop, take a step back, take a breath, and think about what they're doing before they make suggestions to people who are going through this. Um, plus, I've, I've heard from, because I've actually had a couple of, well, one friend, I've had a friend of mine, uh, she went through years uh, battling cancer. And one of the most frustrating things for her was getting all of this advice, constantly getting all of this advice, people uh, uh, just pandering. With, oh, you should try this. Oh, have you heard of this? Um, I've heard great things about this other thing. Um, it, it get, it's annoying. It's really, really annoying. And after years and years of going through this, they just they don't want to hear it. Um, it's, it, it just doesn't work, and it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money, and you're just going to frustrate them. They have a very limited amount of time and energy left to enjoy life, and you shouldn't be wasting it by trying to sell them a miracle. As far as yeah, but I mean, they're linked together, right? I mean, if there's that many people who want to buy it, there's a significant portion of them that want to sell it too, who really believe in it. Like, it's hard to like, it's hard yeah. to get too moral about it, I guess, because I mean, people buy all, all kinds of crazy stuff and sell all kinds of crazy stuff. Religion being one of them, which <laughs> brings sure. us together here. So, how can we like hold these people to a higher standard unless it's like? forced upon them well i just want to hold by law standards i I don't want to hold them to any higher standard i just i expect everyone to i would i would hope everyone would treat any medicine with the same standards as any other medicine Um, yeah albeit i will grant maybe in you know your the 11th hour if you're really desperate trying something different i can absolutely understand that or maybe you just want to be the test subject maybe you want to see if it will work maybe you're willing to do that 
I don't know. There, there are reasons to try them, even if you don't think they'll work. But um, I just, I, I see it having a more negative effect. I've seen it personally in my life. Um, I've heard stories where, generally speaking, whenever someone gives somebody else advice on how to battle cancer, uh, <laughs> excuse me, it's either counterproductive or on, uh, I'm sorry, or it's just not useful. Uh, chances are the ontologist knows a lot more about what's going on. Than your yeah. Yeah. And there's actually, you touched upon, uh, just in that, in that brief example, Caleb, that you just gave, uh, you touched upon two things on my list. Um, you know, how was the claim announced? How was the claim? How did the claim reach you? You know, oh, it was just some guy that told you. Well, if this thing was really true, like, why would you have to hear it from some guy? You know, whether it's a friend or, or, or whoever it may be and not your doctor. You know, it makes no sense that this thing wouldn't be common knowledge among everyone. Uh, and there's also, you know, a lot of the, the things that, that are pushed onto you uh, oftentimes are these natural uh, uh, cures. And, and just the moment you have natural in the title of something, you know, that should be another clue that, you know, it, it may not be entirely real because what about it being natural makes it better you know snake poison is natural it it <laughs> will kill you um or, or natural and they will kill you yeah all kinds of natural things will kill you <laughs> the bears tigers snakes uh you know well, there are natural natural things, things that will save you like your seat belt for example doesn't exist in nature that'll save your life huh? one day no exactly yeah. yeah unnatural things will save you many times uh so you know uh you have to consider the source of information. You have to consider all these other peripheral things. Uh, you know, oftentimes uh, the, the claimants uh, will, uh, you know, if, if it's just some guy that tells you, uh, what they'll also add is that this, this knowledge is suppressed by the government. You know, the government is trying to hide it. There's this big conspiracy. And, um, you know, but... It, it makes no sense because you see people in government and people uh, uh, that, that should have this knowledge, no matter what the conspiracy is, dying from these disease too. And, and they wouldn't be dying if, uh, if there was a cure uh, and, and they were suppressing it because they would take it. So unless you think they're you know, willing to sacrifice their life or something like that. But, um, you know. There's another three good ways to spot fake science, you know, natural fallacy. Uh, how did the claim reach you? And are they claiming that this knowledge is suppressed? Um, yeah, and, and like, like you said, it doesn't just have to be the, suppressed by the government. They might claim they're suppressed by any number of things. For example, they might say, well, uh, I like the big pharma. Right. They say, oh, big pharma doesn't want you to know about this. Well, Actually, you know, the the question I immediately ask myself is, why? If Big Pharma knew of a natural way to cure, you know, the common cold, I think they would much rather sell that than all of the money and all the resources and all the manpower and all the capital and all the, 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 the organization that they have to do in order to make these other synthesized, peer-reviewed, trialed <laughs> drugs. Um, I think they would rather jump on that. It'd be a lot better for their profit margin. So it doesn't necessarily have to be government, but if, if it's if it's any kind of claim that something is being suppressed, that's usually a red flag. That is all the time we have for you this week. This has been the Hoosier Humanist Hour. Be sure to check out Free Thought Fort Wayne on Facebook and on meetup.com. Thank you for listening. And we hope your days are filled with logic, reasoning, and the eternal quest for knowledge.